information security controls are basically anything you can put in place to try to protect your information security. So let's talk about an information security management program and threat modeling and enterprise information security architecture, network security zoning and information security policies, physical security, incident management, types of vulnerability assessments and vulnerability research. So information assurance, this is something that um, actually the software vendors, especially Microsoft, have been trying to put out to make their customers more comfortable. So it is the assurance that the CIA, as well as the authenticity of your information and your system is at all times is going to be good and valid. You're gonna have CIA and authenticity. That's information assurance. We do this by proper development, proper implementation. We adhere to network and local policies. We have proper design and proper user authentication. We identify network vulnerabilities and threats, and that's where you, the hacker, comes in. We identify resource requirements. We apply proper information and assurance controls. We perform certification and accreditation. We provide and require information assurance training. Now, I want to talk really quickly. Certification accreditation, something we teach in CISSB. Certification is when we have rolled out a system, we have done all the security tests necessary, and we assert that it meets all of the security requirements. That's certification. It's a formal testing. Accreditation is management's formal acceptance of certification. So the tech people and the QA people say we certify this system. It meets all of the security requirements per the requirements that were already specified ahead of time. And then management will formally sign off and accept that. That's certification accreditation. So you can have a whole management program to reduce your risk, and you need to, you actually should. Even if you're a small organization, you should have a mini version of information security and managing your information security. If nothing else, it means keeping everybody up to date on antivirus and patching and reading up on the latest threats. I mean, if nothing else. And then probably if you're a small organization, you outsource some of your security to a vendor. So there are programs that called information security management programs. Notice manage the information security. Managing information security, staying on top of it, this allows us to reduce risk. And you know, a lot of management is all about reducing risk and managing risk. That's really the role of management. So um, we have this information security management program. It's used in all aspects of the organization and all of the security principles, everyone involved. The program is going to be a combination of well-defined policies, processes, procedures, standards, guidelines to establish a required level of information security. So what is an information security framework? A framework is simply a formal structure that you have adopted and you've possibly modified for your own use. You know, other people have gone this path before you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Take an existing framework and then modify it to suit you. So you'll have all these parts here. It'll start with a policy. It'll identify roles and responsibilities. There will be guidelines. And there's some popular frameworks here. You don't need to memorize these by any means, but there's PCI DSS, there's ISO 27000 series, there's CIS uh, security controls, there's NIST. So um, when we do uh, information security uh, management and we have a framework, notice all the moving parts here. So it's all these well-defined policies and processes and procedures, standards, guidelines, etc. The whole thing adds up to a required level of information security. Notice the policy dictates everything else. It overarches everything else. We've got who's responsible, all of our guidelines, all of our risk management, our how our whole security is structured, the architecture. We classify all of the assets that we have. We have security management. We have security operations. We make sure that the business is resilient. There's business continuity and disaster recovery. 
there's training, and then there's metrics so we can see how we're doing in reporting. And the whole thing is controlled from above, governance, and meets compliance standards, whether they are company or legal requirements, legal compliance. So here's an example, security um, a framework. So whatever this framework is, you plan, you assess, you secure, you monitor, you protect, you manage this whole thing. We have management for identity and access controls, network and infrastructure, data and information, and compliance. So this is just one example. Threat modeling. This is a risk management approach that we use to analyze our current security. So with threat modeling, what you're doing is you're going, you're starting with what are you trying to protect? We're trying to protect the data in this database. Now generally, we're not trying to protect a server. We're generally trying to protect information or a system that people need to use. So you say, what is it that ultimately we're trying to protect? All right, now what are all the possible attack vectors? <laughs> we could get flooded out. That's environmental. We could have a fire. So you can have environmental, environmental physical things. There could be theft. There could be viruses. There could be um, advanced persistent threats. There could be remote access. There could be misuse by users. So you, you list all of these many, many possible attack vectors. And then you, you rank the probability and impact of each one of these. And now I know that this is like on a scale of one to 100, this is a 90%, a 90. And then this one's an 80, and this one's a 70, and this one's a 55, and this one's a 23, based on probability times impact. And then you use that to rank, what do we have to focus on first? That is the whole concept behind threat modeling. So it helps us determine our objectives. Uh, we try to um, figure out what it is, the application, how it is. Uh, you know, we deconstruct it um, to identify the threats and the vulnerabilities. So this whole thing, we can have a whole structure, what we call an enterprise information security architecture. It's all the requirements, all the possible processes, all the principles and models that defines the whole structure of our information security. Helps us identify and prioritize and understand cost benefit and um, figure out what our assets are and perform our risk assessment. That's the whole purpose of enterprise information security architecture. We can also divide up our network into security zones. So we'll have, um, and this determines how much protection you put on each. So like the internet, totally uncontrolled, outside of our scope. The DMZ, controlled. Um, it's an area between the internet and the internal network. It needs to have some controls, but it needs to be publicly accessible. There's a production zone, restricted. Access is strictly controlled. There's the intranet. It's controlled, but people are using it normally, no extreme restrictions. Maybe there's a management zone for uh, IT that's secured with strict policies. You get together with your network and system administrator to figure out the zones, so to speak, because different levels of security have to be applied to different zones. Then you have your information security policy. This is the thing that drives everything else. It's the basis for your whole information security infrastructure. It defines your basic requirements and the rules to be implemented. And its goals are we want to maintain and administer security. We want to protect our resources. We don't want to legally get in trouble. We want to uh, not waste our computing resources. No unauthorized access, no unauthorized modification. We want to define who has what access rights. We want to protect our proprietary and confidential information from theft, misuse, and unauthorized disclosure. So you can have all kinds of policies. Your policies could be like no restriction whatsoever, or highly permissive, or prudent, meaning maximum security, block everything unless you need it, or paranoid with like no connectivity. So you can have different levels. But within your overall policy, there will be all these sub policies, password policy, mobile device policy, remote access policy, network policy, 
internet policy, um, acceptable use policy. So you'll have this blanketing policy with all these little subparts. So all of these are examples of subparts of your overall information security policy. Access control, remote access, firewall, network connections, password, user accounts, um, how to protect information, who has special access, email, acceptable use. These are just a few examples. There will also be privacy policies, and this is totally for HR, um, but it dovetail dovetails with IT as well. So employers typically will have access to employee personal information, so there has to be workplace privacy, and this will be this will involve your legal team. And it's not for it's not for IT people to determine; it's for IT people to implement based on what is required. So um, you'll tell people what's going to be collected. You maintain accurate records. You provide uh, employees with access to their information, and you keep it secure. So you need to create and implement all these policies. To do this, risk assessment, use proper standards. You have to involve senior management. It has to be driven by them. You have penalties for non-compliance. You have a final version. Everyone signs off. Everyone's trained. Everyone understands. You enforce it, and you regularly update it and review it. You involve HR and legal, because they're the ones who are going to tell you what are the requirements from the outside. Part of your whole information security policy will include physical controls, like what's going to have biometric versus keypad cipher locks versus cameras versus guards versus gates. Um, so you need to, with physical security controls, protect the premises because that will protect servers and workstations. You need to protect how people come in at the reception area, where any of the equipment is, the way they're going to access it, physical access control. How are we going to maintain our computers and our equipment? What about wiretapping, the risk of that, and environmental controls? All of these support information security protection. There will be incidents. There will be. It's like riding a motorcycle. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So when there's an incident, how do you handle that? There needs to be incident response and incident management. So we have to have a process and a procedure that everyone's trained in to deal with a security incident and learn from it to prevent future incidents. So incident management will include how do we handle vulnerabilities? How do we handle artifacts that are left over from the incident? How do we announce to employees and the press and the general public and shareholders? What are our alerts? And how do you handle an incident when it happens? How do you, what's your first response, your triage? Uh, then your further response, your reporting and your detection, and finally your analysis, and anything else. We need to prepare for these incidents. We need to be able to detect that these incidents are happening. We need to be able to classify and prioritize what's, what we have to deal with first. How do we notify? How do we contain? How do we do after the fact forensic investigation? How do we eradicate the um, malicious stuff and recover? And have any post-incident activities, which are typically lessons learned? How do we manage security issues using a proactive approach? rather than a reactive approach. We need to make sure there's a single point of contact for reporting security incidents. Because, you know, when you're in the middle of something, you do not want the receptionist talking to the news media. You want to have how that information go out to be controlled, as well as the response team has to have a way to talk to each other that doesn't freak out people standing by who don't understand what you mean. Who, they just hear something, they think it's something then you more than what you mean. So there has to be control on, between the response team, the response team to management, and management to employees, and management to the general public and the media, the news media. So there has to be a, a process for generally reviewing and checking our whole incident response. Um, we need to make sure that all procedures are followed to minimize and control damage. We don't want people doing the antler dance. You know what the antler dance is? People are running around going, ah! Okay, you don't want that. Certainly not your incident response team. 
We want to review all the existing controls, make recommendations to keep up with technology, make sure that um, we are checking the impact of any incident, and if necessary, work with law enforcement, government agencies, partners, and suppliers. So that's what we need to know about information security. Now let's talk about vulnerability assessment.